After high school, having no better ideas, I joined the Navy SEALs. I never really liked any of it, but it was a job after all. I loved the guns and airplanes and grenades, but having to run all the time while some scumbag with a chip on his shoulder yells in my face isn't my idea of fun. Things got a lot more interesting after my term of service ended. I still had a high security clearance, so I used it to take temporary jobs as a mercenary, a hired gun. I did some stints in Iraq with Blackwater, where they set me out in the middle of the desert. A watchtower and oil refinery loomed over the burning sands. Along with a few other guys, they told us, guard this area with your life. While better than the SEALs, working for Blackwater was extremely boring. The other mercenaries and I would mostly just chain smoke cigarettes and drink coffee all night, staring out across the dead, empty desert. Over time, I worked my way up. Things started to get more interesting when a job offer arrived in my email one freezing cold winter's morning. This is what it said. Mr. Chase, I am the head of security for a private group of entrepreneurs and investors. Through some mutual contacts, I have heard of your professionalism and experience. We are currently putting together a small crew to guard a private event on Island, out in the Pacific Ocean, that will run from January 9th to January 26th. Would you be interested in this job? The pay rate is $900 a day. Once you are on the island, it will be impossible to leave until the period of employment has ended. If you are interested, please respond to this email as soon as possible. Sincerely, Mario Antonin, Head of Security. I was working piecemeal jobs like this one at a time, but none of them were paying that well. At most, I would usually get $350 to $500 a day, which was still good money when I was working 7 days a week until the job finished. I instantly responded and said that yes, I was interested. In response, they sent me a non-disclosure agreement that was the size of a small novel that I had to sign. That was how I found myself on a private jet, flying out to an island in the middle of the vast blue ocean. I was never told the coordinates of the island or saw it on a map. It was all kept very secret. A few hours later, we landed on a private airstrip. I looked out the window of the jet, seeing the tropical waters of the Pacific Ocean stretching off to the horizon in every direction. Below me stood an island with palm trees and sandy white beaches. An enormous Victorian mansion loomed directly in the center of it all. The mansion was painted black and looked like something straight out of a horror movie. It had no windows, and the turrets spiraled into blade-like points. That was my first inkling that something might not be quite right about this trip. As the stairs from the private jet descended, I looked out on this strange new world. Employees waited to greet us, looking like beaten dogs. Some had their heads down, their eyes blankly scanning the ground. Most of them were women wearing red dresses, reminding me of stewardesses on a plane. The jet strip was surrounded by palm trees and tropical brush. The chirping of insects sounded all around us, high and resonant. I saw a strange patch engraved on all of the employees' uniforms and jackets. It almost looked like a stick figure drawing of a man, the bottom of its body ending in a C. Its arms were long and jointed, almost spidery. Three symbols, like repeated iron crosses, connected to the left side of its body in a line. I wondered if it was the logo of some company. I put it out of my mind for now. But I would see that symbol again all over the island, painted on the sides of the mansion and even cut into the trees with a knife. It would only be later that night that I realized its connection to Malik. Good day, sir, and welcome to the island. The server on my left said with glassy eyes and a fake smile plastered across her face. They all looked up at once, but it was like the workers all looked through me rather than at me. Their eyes looked flat and dead, like the painted-on eyes of a doll. The island, huh? I asked, curious. They wouldn't tell me where I was going. They said it was a secret. Is that what you call it? The woman just nodded, the doll-like smile never leaving her lips. Officially, this island is unnamed and uninhabited, the woman said. In fact, all traces of it have been scrubbed from the internet. You won't find it on Google Maps or in any publicly available satellite imagery. She leaned forward towards me with heavily mascarated eyes and ruby-red lipstick slashed across her lips. 
This is a very special place. Only very special people are allowed here. You should be honored to work here under our savior. I hope you're talking about Jesus or something. I said jokingly. She just smiled blankly and motioned me forward. Just follow that trail for a few hundred feet, she said, pointing at an opening in the palm trees where locks were laid down horizontally over the muggy jungle. And you'll find the mansion. Good luck. I thought it was a somewhat strange thing to say, wishing a random stranger good luck. But by the end of that night, I realized that simply to make it off this island alive, I would need lots of it. I followed the woman's directions to the back of the brutalist mansion. A heavy metal door stood there with a small bulletproof window built in the top. A tanned Spanish face glowered out at me, then rapidly drew back and disappeared. A few heartbeats later, the door slid to the side with a grinding of hidden gears. The head of security at the island was a heavily tattooed ex-marine named Mario. He wore a dark Kevlar vest over a black outfit, making him look like a walking shadow. I found the security at their own private complex in the mansion as he showed me around the site. Hundreds of hidden cameras covered every angle of the mansion and the surrounding parts of the island. Dozens of clad black security agents swarmed over the screens checking the monitors and computers constantly. Quite a setup you have here. I said to Mario, nodding at him. He smacked me on the shoulder, giving a confident grin. Money is no issue here, Richard. He responded. Security is paramount. There are things on this island that could rip apart the world if they ever escaped. I raised an eyebrow. Like what? I asked. Nuclear weapons or something? He laughed at that. You'll see for yourself tonight, he said, his dark eyes flashing with something cold and alien. Mario let me and a couple other new hired guns around the island. The place was certainly strange. It reminded me of some combination of a secret black ops site and a playboy billionaire's private heaven. All of the doors in the mansion looked like they were made of thick steel. They had wheels that would spin like those on a submarine door. The mansion also had no windows at all that I could see, except for the small shatterproof glass openings on the steel doors. I didn't want to ask too many questions, however. I couldn't resist asking him about a couple small things. Or at least, they seemed small to me at the time. What are those hatchways? I asked Mario, pointing to rectangular covers built into the concrete walkway. They had heavy handles. Are those manholes or something? There are tunnels under the island, he responded vaguely, just for maintenance and security, you understand. Wow, this place is certainly well developed, I said. We came out through a grove of palm trees, a stone walkway led down to a white beach. Dozens of yachts were moored all across the shore, some of them looking like they must have cost hundreds of millions of dollars. There is a lot of money and power here, Mario said. That's why it's important you never talk about what you see here. These are the people who control the world, the ones behind the government and the media, not the elected officials who the people see, but the actual power. Like who? I asked. You mean the Rothschilds and Soros? He laughed again, a sarcastic, grinding laugh that grated my nerves. Trust me, the truly powerful ones don't even have public personas. If you know their name, then they're just one of the puppets. I just shook my head at that, then asked the real question that had been bothering me since I first arrived here. Who is the savior? I asked. Is that some code name or something? Mario froze in place. He's the one who runs everything here, he whispered conspiratorially, looking around nervously. But don't be mentioning that kind of shit. You'll probably see him tonight anyway. He's the one who runs the show. He'll be on the stage in his normal outfit. By the end of the day, I was suited up like the rest of the security staff, wearing the pure black pants and shirt with the symbol of Malik engraved over the heart. Hundreds of the world's most famous politicians, actors, businessmen, and artists had gathered, streaming in the front doors with a soft, diffident susurration. I stood by the open doorway of a side exit with an AR-15 in full body armor next to one other soldier. They had also given me a sidearm. 
Every entrance or exit was manned by at least two armed men. The security at this place was some of the most intense I had ever seen. Beyond the door, there were rows and rows of the most comfortable seats, all gathered in a semicircle around a massive stage made of pure mahogany. Blood-red curtains stood closed at the front of the room, concealing their secrets. For now at least. Hail Satan! I heard the elites cry inside in unison. I didn't want to look in at the rows of high-ranking politicians, celebrities, influencers, and artists, but my curiosity was high. I peeked around the corner of the stone archway, seeing the red curtains on the stage drawing apart. I saw one of my favorite actors standing in the front row, clapping excitedly and jumping up and down. The crowd cheered as a naked female strapped to an obsidian altar lay there. She was beautiful and blonde, probably no older than twenty with the face of a supermodel. Her mouth was gagged, her arms outstretched like Jesus on the cross. Thin leather cords were tied around her wrists and ankles, biting deeply into the skin. Her eyes rolled widely as she shook her head from side to side. She froze, and her eyes met mine for a brief moment. I saw the pleading expression there, the moral terror and absolute horror. A man in a coat mask wearing black robes slunk out from the side of the stage, carrying a wavy silver dagger engraved with strange symbols. The crowd erupted into a primal roar of pleasure and excitement that sounded like it came from one monstrous mouth. Worthy is the lamb, the man in the goat mask screamed with electronic amplification. He had a deep voice, as if he had rocks rolling around in his throat. The crowd roared and clapped, scattered cries of, Hail Lucifer, and Ave Satanas echoed down the massive auditorium. Hey, pay attention. The other security agent at my side said in a thick Finnish accent. He was a tall Scandinavian looking guy named Colmack. You're not getting paid to watch the show, new guy. I tried to rip my gaze away from the stage, but it held my attention with an obsessive horror. The burnt bones of children and women have been offered to the ancient ones, to Malik. The men on the stage cried. Under our feet, the burnt bodies of hundreds lay dreaming. This victim will be the 666th. Her blood will bring out the Nazis that we seek. The direct experience of the divine held by the gods, by Lucifer, and Malek, and Baal. The roaring of the crowd temporarily drowned out his electronically magnified voice. Tonight, we will rip open the veil. I had stopped watching the show, instead staring blankly out at the beach and palm trees. At that moment, another black-clad security agent came up to my partner, whispered something in his ear, then immediately disappeared, heading off back in the direction of the main security office. Colmack shook his head grimly. I'll be right back, he said. Stay right here, don't move from this door no matter what, and pay attention. I nodded and watched as he walked off in the same direction. I immediately took the opportunity to continue watching the ceremony. I had missed something important, apparently. The woman now lay dead on the sacrificial table. A gaping hole in her chest, blood spurted from the crater as the man in the goat mask held her beating heart grasped tightly in his hand, letting the blood stream down his naked fingers. The crowd cheered with a rising bloodlust and insanity. Most of them were standing, their eyes gleaming and white with fanatical adoration. The entire spectacle reminded me of some kind of ancient Aztec ritual. As the woman's sightless eyes stared vacantly up in death, the man in a goat mask pulled out a can of gasoline. The clear liquid gurgled as he upended the canister over her pale, bloodless face, over her naked stomach and long legs. A moment later, he lit a match and dropped it. I heard the whooshing of the flames as they rose up. The crowd went deathly silent as they watched the rippling flames. The man in the goat mask began chanting in some strange language I had never heard before. It sounded Semitic, but I knew it wasn't Arabic or Hebrew. I felt something like electricity ripple through the air, almost like a feeling of falling pressure before a storm. I looked down at the hairs on my arms, seeing them rise up. I looked back up at the stage, and my eyes widened in horror. 
the flaming body of the sacrificial victim had started to morph before my eyes and the eyes of the crowd. The dripping, blackening flesh jumped up and down as if there were rats trapped in their body trying to escape the fire. There was a deafening hissing as if thousands of snakes were being burned alive. The dead woman's arms jerked up, the skin splitting open as if she had seams running along her skin. Something dark and muscular with curving black talons ripped its way out of the dead, burning flesh. Behind it, a head appeared with long curving horns and eyes that spun with whirls of fire. It looked like the offspring of a bull and a demon. Its imposing body rose up from the inferno, appearing like magic from the solid stone. It raised itself to its full height, looming over the crowd. The last of the woman's blood hissed and boiled away, her flesh dissolving into ashes. Behold, Moloch rises. The man in the goat mask screamed in a fanatical voice. The crowd's cheering had stopped though. Many of the faces in the crowd looked chalk white with terror. The bull god surveyed the crowd, its horns nearly scraping the ceiling 20 feet above the stage. At that moment, I knew death was on its way with eyes of fire and a grin like a skull, ready to reap a field of human bodies. I heard running behind me, but I didn't dare turn away from the horrific sight in front of me. The last of the fire's embers died, sending up thin wisps of grey smoke that spiraled around the bull god's monstrous face. Moloch stood as still as a statue, and if it weren't for one thing, I might have thought it was some sort of sculpture or art project. He had two nostrils like a serpent's. As his great lungs inhaled, the smoke billowed in and out of his mouth and nose. Some of the people at the edges of the crowd had gotten up, hurrying towards the doors. Malik's head ratcheted to face them, his fiery eyes narrowing into slits. Do not leave, the man in the goat mask pleaded. Those who have fear are not worthy of life. Do not prove yourselves unworthy of life. As the first of the fleeing men and women got within a few steps of the door, Malik gave a primal roar. In a blur of primal strength, he reached down and ripped the blackened sacrificial altar off the stage. It ripped from the wooden stage with a tremendous crack like a bullwhip. He hurled the heavy mass of stone at those heading towards the opposite exit from the one I guarded. I watched it curve through the air. The people started screaming and clawing to escape as it smashed down on their heads with a grating crash. I could feel the floor shake from where I stood outside. Blood exploded from their smashed bodies. I saw arms and legs jerking and seizing under the heavy stone. But within a few moments, they slowed and then stopped. Others were running towards the door I guarded. But Malik leapt off the stage in a blur. In a few bounding steps, he reached the pale, terrified faces on the other side of the threshold. His massive clawed hand came down. I heard bones shatter as blood sprayed my face and wall. Bone splinters and pieces of brain exploded from the screaming bodies. I backpedaled, wiping at my eyes, trying to get the blood off so I could see. No one had told me what to do in this situation. I didn't know if I was supposed to shoot that massive abomination, or if this was all just part of the show. Richard! A familiar voice cried from behind me. Panic oozed from every word. I spun, seeing Mario and Colmac standing side by side. Their pupils dilated and expressions grim. We have a major problem. It was Mario. I recognized that voice. The one that sounded as if he had been gargling with rocks. I know, I said, holding my rifle tightly. I pointed behind me at the scene of rampant death and destruction. I had seen bloodshed and war before, but this was different. The island itself seemed to feel it. The wind, which had been calm when I first landed, now whipped the island in fast, circular currents. The breeze smelt of burnt matches and coppery blood. The static electricity which had caused the hairs on my arms to rise rippled over everything with tiny blue flashes, increasing in power by the second. No, no, not Malik, Colmac said, looking much calmer than I felt. The savior lets Malik thin the hurt every year. It's Leviathan, Mario continued grimly. The beast from the waters. The smell of blood is drawing it from the depths of the ocean. We picked up the first blips on radar a few minutes ago. When it gets here, it won't stop until everything is rubble. 
it will kill every single person on the island. All security personnel must report to the South Beach immediately. A cool robotic voice cried out over hidden loudspeakers all over the island. The screaming from the auditorium had quieted behind me. I was afraid to look inside. There it is, Colmex said, his head jerking up as the emergency alert sounded. He motioned for me to follow. It's time to fight. We sprinted over curving rails of smooth locks between deathly quiet forests. All the insects and birds had gone silent. Ahead of us, the palm trees opened up onto the Pacific Ocean, but it was no longer a beautiful tropical blue. A black, swirling whirlpool like an ulcerous wound had opened up on its surface. It stretched hundreds of feet across, drawing closer to the shore by the second. Dead fish, sharks, dolphins, squids, and even whales spun in the filthy dark water. Twenty black-clad security agents waited for the three of us on the beach, their eyes white, their faces pale with terror. Like myself, they all had AR-15s and Glock 22s, with extra magazines for both. I guess the Glock might be useful for blowing my brains out as a last resort if some beast from hell rose out of the simmering waters. But I didn't think it would stop anything from another dimension. The clouds swirled overhead in a thick curtain as black as smoke. Flashes of blue lightning detonated every couple seconds. Mari raised his hands, screaming over the roaring of the wind. Colmac stood by my side, his face grim and eyes narrowed. Your job is to fight off anything that tries to get on the island, he said, looking from one face to another with rapt attention. Nothing can stand against high-caliber rifle fire. Shoot at the face and eyes when it comes up. We've dealt with creatures like this before, and they will retreat if you injure them badly enough. I had the sense of being fed a line of bullshit as my mind processed this. What exactly is coming up? One of the doe-eyed security men asked. He looked barely old enough to drink. A young muscular hulk with a marine corps tattoo on his neck. They call it Leviathan. Mario responded. Sometimes the rituals here and the smell of blood can draw. Strange things. Leviathan is one of those. We have encountered it before. The most important thing to remember is... His voice was suddenly drowned out by a terrible cacophony that came from the center of the Black Whirlpool. A screech like the detonation of a nuclear missile shook the ground. The ocean jumped and bubbled frantically. The beach heaved and cracked, the white sands disappearing in fissures that opened up like greedy mouths underneath my feet. I lost my balance, falling forwards. The screeching continued rising into a primal roar. A green dragon head, the color of an infected wound, erupted from the surface of the thrashing water, rising up dozens of feet in the air. It had two enormous, slitted eyes that dilated and constricted quickly as it glowered down at us. The screeching abruptly stopped, the pointed mouth of the dragon slamming shut with a sound like a gunshot. Within moments, another cancerous green head shot up in a blur, its skin looking as hard as stone. Ridges that looked as sharp as swords ran the lengths of its reptilian skull, arcing over its eyes and pointed snout. More hits erupted from the ocean until all seven hits of Leviathan loomed over us. Not one of us fired. No one even seemed to breathe as we surveyed the beast across the no man's land of the white sands. The slitted eyes and yellow irises of the seven hits had a demonic hunger, a reptilian coldness. Far behind us, I heard distant screams still echoing from the auditorium where Malik held sway. Fire! Mario cried. Instantly, a cacophony of gunshots exploded all around me. I jumped up on my feet, scrambling up as the seven-headed dragon leapt forward. Thousands of gallons of salt water streamed down its massive body as it came up on the beach. Long black paws with bone-white talons shot out of the surging ocean, followed by a tapering tail like that of a water snake. I brought the rifle up and emptied my magazine as fast as I could, pulling the trigger over and over as I aimed at the many slitted eyes of Leviathan. But the bullets seemed to ping harmlessly off of its heart obsidian-like scales. It scrabbled onto the shore, the hits coming down in a blur. Rows and rows of vampiric fangs gleamed dully in each of the mouths. One security agent was bitten in half, the spurting stump of his lower body still standing for a long moment, even as the rest of the body disappeared down the throat of the dragon. 
Mario ran for it, slamming another magazine in his rifle and opening fire point blank. One of the hits came down in a blur towards him. Its great, staring eyes exploded in a shower of blue blood and thick, vitreous fluid. The dragon head pulled back, its mouth opening in a primal scream of agony. As I reloaded, I scanned the area around me, realizing that nearly half of the security agents were either dead or critically injured. I backpedaled away, keeping my eyes on the dragon. It continuously drew forward, killing more of its enemies with every step. I turned and ran into the forest, the sounds of shattering bones and dying men ringing through the air with a sickening clarity behind me. Once I had reached the border of the trail, I heard Mario yell, Retreat! behind me. But by that point, it was far too late. Hey, wait up! A voice whispered from behind me. I turned my head, seeing Komak. Spatters of drying blood covered his face and uniform. As far as I could tell, none of it was his. Mario's dead. They're all dead. We need to get out of here. We need to get off the island. How? I asked. Find the savior. He answered, panting and out of breath. We must find him. He can get us out of here. I don't even know what the guy looks like. I muttered. He was wearing a goat mask. You'll know when you see him. Colmex said. His body is covered in scars. Everything except his face. Stay close to me. We need to watch each other's backs. It's our only chance of survival. A trail of twisted, broken bones led from the mansion to the surrounding trails and beaches. A decapitated woman with solid gold necklaces embedded with diamonds lay in front of me. It was strange on the island the way oblivion and ineffable wealth coexisted side by side. But everything was deadly silent, even in the mansion's auditorium. Where's the savior? I asked through gritted teeth. I picked my head into the auditorium, but nothing moved. Hundreds of smashed and bloody bodies littered the floor. He's around somewhere, Colmac answered. We started circling the mansion, looking for any signs of life. Colmac went in the lead. As he turned the corner, an enormous black hand with sharp claws of fingers flitted forward in a blur, wrapping itself around his chest. Colmac gave a strangled cry as it closed around him. I heard his bones crush as a spout of blood and gore flew from his mouth and nose, as if he were a toothpaste tube being squeezed. I backpedaled away as Malik threw the twitching corpse aside like a discarded toy. It smashed into the wall of the mansion, exploding wetly. A human-shaped, bloody stain languidly tripped down the wall above Kolmak's mangled body. Malek slowly turned his head towards me, the fiery eyes flashing with hunger. He gnashed his fangs together, taking a step forward with a leg the size and shape of a tree trunk. With every step he took, I felt the ground tremble. Stop! I cried, moving away from the monstrous creature. Why are you doing this? There is no why. He gurgled, his voice monstrous and inhumanly slow. There is only power. The weak deserve to die. Only the strong are worthy of life. I raised my rifle in a last-ditch effort to save myself. Malek saw it and started running towards me, every footstep crunching the paved walkway around the mansion into rubble and dust. I aimed for his eyes and nose, emptying the entire magazine as quickly as I could. The bullet smashed into Malak's face. Dark red, clotted blood dripped out of the wounds, writhing with maggots. Drops of it fell around me, landing on my hair and face. I felt the small larva twisting all over my skin. Malak's blood smelled nauseating, like some combination of stink bugs and rotting bodies. He slowed, giving a roar of pain. I turned to run in the opposite direction. But as I looked out in the direction of the beach, my heart dropped. Leviathan was moving in our direction, the giant dragon heads looming over the trees. Quickly, it swept towards me like a dark wind. You will suffer for that, worthless slave. Malek growled, wiping blood from his fiery eyes with his sharp talons of fingers. A sudden idea came to me. I ran in the direction of Leviathan. Malek followed closely at my heels, only a few steps behind. 
Leviathan slithered forward over the sands and trees, its enormous body undulating like a water snake's. I screamed at it, an incomprehensible wail of terror. Its seven hits snapped towards me. Its slitted eyes widened as it saw Malik. I heard the crashing of Malik's footsteps stop behind me, only feet away from crushing me into a paste. His massive lungs breathed quickly, exhaling the odor of sulfur and smoke. Leviathan. Malek growled in his demonic voice. These are my tributes. Leviathan's dragon heads looked straight up at the sun and screamed in response, their many voices rising and falling in a dissonant wail. As I sprinted into the trees, Leviathan and Malek ran at each other, colliding with an ear-splitting crash. I glanced back, seeing Malik ripping one of the dragon hits off its neck with his sharp fingers. The head screamed as blue blood exploded from the spurting stump. After a long moment, the neck fell limply forward. The other dragon hits bit Malik in a unified attack. They ripped deep holes in his shoulders and arms, snapping over and over like rabbit dogs. As the two eldritch monstrosities attacked each other in fierce combat, I lost sight of them. But the sounds of fighting echoed over the entire island, crashing like lightning. I felt like the survivor of an apocalypse. I couldn't find a single other living person on the island. Hundreds of crushed, broken, and decapitated bodies surrounded me. Over the cacophony of fighting, I heard a new noise. The whirring of helicopter blades nearby. It was coming from the other side of the mansion. Frantically, I sprinted around the other side seeing a Black Hawk helicopter getting ready to leave. A man in black robes sat at the pilot seat, his gray eyes gleaming and a white smile plastered across his face. I smashed my fist into the door over and over until he opened it. Holy shit, you're still alive? He asked. I hadn't seen this man before. He had a face like a Calvin Klein model, all sharp angles and high cheekbones, perfectly proportioned in every way. But his scalp looked melted and scarred, as if someone had thrown gasoline on his hair and ignited it. His eyes were stunted, twisted growths of scar tissue. His hands, too, were covered in deep, folding burn scars. Are you the savior? I responded quickly. Please get me out of here. They do call me that, he said wistfully. The savior. Yes, I guess I am. Get in. The savior stared at me with his strange green eyes, the color of swamps where monstrous things swam under the surface. Some people just need to learn the hard way, he said. The helicopter took off in a dark night, covered with bright, twinkling stars. There is no great power without great responsibility after all. Those of us who seek the Ancient Ones know it comes with a cost. I just stared out the window gazing down at the countless mutilated, broken bodies that littered the beach. Below us, the face of a bull stared up, with eyes of fiery cyclones. The broken, still body of Leviathan lay at his feet. As we made it over the great waters of the Pacific Ocean, the bull god raised a hand and waved. At that moment, I thought... I could almost see a hurricane of translucent souls circling around them, spiraling up into the sky. <laughs>